What up, y'all? I'm Steve with Elevate, and I'm really excited to have this Elevated 8 with Mylon Townsend. Super cool. Uh, it's just been like, I grew up with the guy basically in the glass career without ever meeting him. Uh, really quickly, I'd like to mention, uh, we could use your help uh, building our brand, uh, getting the message out there about Elevate, growing mind, body, and spirit. Check it out at elevateambassadors.com. You could be a gent or a doll, and it's really, really cool. You can earn credits, you can earn all kinds of stuff. You get deals on new products that we release, all kinds of stuff. Also, check out Elevate Veterans. It's a really cool program we put on to help veterans get alternative healing access. Uh, anyways, let's roll into this Elevated 8 with Mylon Townsend. Well, welcome to Elevated 8. We got Mylon Townsend here, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. It's great to hook up, even though we're in different places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I've been following you before the IG and all that stuff. Just you've been in my life for the, almost the last 20 years. Um, and so I guess the question is, how did you get into this this glass thing? Like, Well, you know, it wasn't a straight line, right? Um, Mom and dad would never stop and buy fireworks when we went to Florida. So I had to make my own. So, you know, I did some of that. And then one day in uh, high school, somebody had twisted a piece of tubing in a little burns torch in the biology lab. And it was just had a very graceful line to it that appealed to me. So somehow that night, one of those torches and some tubing ended up in my house. How did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> and so the crazy thing is that my mom and dad let me mess around with hot glass in my bedroom when I was 15 with no fireproof work surface, no fire extinguisher, no ventilation, no supervision. They just let me do it. So here we are today. Well, thank you, mom and dad, for that, you know, letting it happen because, uh, man, it's, uh, yeah, so it, it's been a journey. So how long have you been blowing glass now? Like when, yeah, that was 15 when you started. I have now, so you do the math. Yeah, wow, man, that's right? pretty cool. Yeah. Ah, boy. And I work seven days a week, eight to 14 hours a day. Really? Always, 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 always. And you've done that your whole life? Well, I'm going to have to take a couple of days off right now because I've been working like that since March and I'm just beat. We do two festivals, one in Texas in the spring, one in Maryland in the fall. And I do commissions for people. We do a little bit of wholesale work still. And right now I have orders for commissions until July of next year. All right. So it's good, but you know, when do you breathe, right? Mm -hmm. That was one of the great things about last year. We all took time to breathe because, you know, there wasn't anything else to do. Of right. course, I made the fables, but it was really nice just to chill out a little bit. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't spend a lot of time not working. Right, right. Do you have any hobbies outside of glass then uh, that, that yeah. take up time? Well, um, uh, photography. I shoot all my own work, but also I like nature. I photograph a lot of nature, both on the macro and the uh, micro, both uh, very large scale and very small scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I scuba dive and also I grow hot peppers and I make hot, spicy things. I make oil, <laughs> I make spreads and make jams and chilies, peanut butter. We grow our own reapers and ghost peppers. And these are very, very hot. Yeah. So yeah. I was really thrilled to discover you can grow this stuff in upstate New York where we have a lot of winter. You don't have to be in Trinidad to make hot peppers. So I do a lot of that. Yep. And so do you have to start the plants like way sooner inside and then move them out probably? Or um, one year I started them in Texas I brought them to New York and we put them in the ground and then I dug them up and took them with us to Maryland where they fruited. And that was ridiculous. Um, so last year we had the whole season here. So that was no problem. And now my sister, she likes to garden. So she's growing them for me. So uh, I don't have to grow them myself anymore, but it was really nice to have a whole season to mess around with the scotch bonnets and the ghosts and the, Trinidad scorpions and all those really hot peppers. They're very, very nice. And they're all very different. Yeah. Totally look different, different colors. It's just, yep. it's neat how, how nature does that. And, and then in your photography, you mentioned you do macro and micro. Do you feel the, the macro really helps you 
also uh, see the details and then be able to put that into your glass? Well, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I do a lot of reference material. I mean, I use a lot of reference material. And I'm very excited. I haven't taught at Corning for about seven or eight years. And the last five years I taught there, I was doing casting. So I haven't done flame working there for 12 years. So I'm, I'm going to do a flame working class next summer in July. There's only nine spots. So if anybody's interested, it's going to be cool. Yeah. Um, and the, the focus is on uh, how to make... Uh, Paul Stankard, you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, he talks about something he calls orability, to make your object believable. Um, so I'm very interested in the fine detail, the articulation, the definition that makes a form believable, a fish, a flower, an insect, a bird, a mammal. So that's kind of going to be the focus of the class. One day we'll do insects, another day we'll be do plants, another day we'll do fish. And there's principles that underlie each of these forms. And if you get your, the basic principle, then you can apply it to all fish or all birds or all insects or whatever it is. So I'm very excited. It should be a really great class. And uh, in your questions, you, you asked about what classes have I taken that have helped me? Never were any classes, but teaching classes, I learned just as much as everybody else. So for me, I love, especially at Corning, because they've got the museum, they've got the library. Oh. Your class is going on at the same time. I love Corning. It's a great place. And I'm really, really excited to be teaching there again after not having done it for such a long time. So that'll be, that'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you mentioned, uh, you didn't get to take a lot of classes because you were the forefather, basically pioneering a lot of this stuff it, in this field and a lot around here, I feel like. Um, and then, so yeah, the classes and whatnot and uh, taking them or, or, or giving them, like you said, uh, you, you both learn. And so if you're in a class, whether you're the student or the teacher, if you got your, uh, your mind right, you're going to learn a great deal. So I always look forward to it. Classes are not about uh, income. They're about mm, generating, broadening the way that you think. Uh, Glass Art Society conferences were like that for me when I first started going a long time ago. Um, it really broadened the way I thought, and it was really good for me. Yeah. One thing, then, you know, flame working, we spend a lot of time by ourselves. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then we have to get out in the world and see people. And it's really important to get out so we can see what other people are doing and have them look at what we're doing and have some give and take about that. Yeah, and that helps us all grow. You can help somebody else grow. Somebody else helps you grow. And uh, yeah, Absolutely. And, and I bet those uh, meetings and stuff, they were even more important, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago um, as compared to now with the Instagram and all this and videos that people are putting out. I noticed even you put out a lot of videos really quickly showing how to, how to make little figurines. Today, on, on Thursday, I do that. I have like a one minute video. Um, yes, I've enjoyed that a lot. I started doing it last year during COVID and, uh, I just wanted to reach out to people and have something to talk about and like that, an unlimited amount of different things that you can do. So I haven't repeated myself yet and I've been doing it every week for about a year and a half. So that's about 60 or 75 different one minute videos. My wife says I should just repeat them to relax a little bit but i haven't quite got to that point yet yeah i mean it, it seems like you're a workaholic or just you're you're such a creator that you can't redo it again you just gotta well, create I, I think creativity is a result of productivity so the more you're putting out the higher the chance that some of it will be interesting <laughs> i like that right it's like a shotgun just keep shooting until you you hit something and <laughs> No, I hit what I'm aiming at. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah, yeah. Right on. Um, uh, had, did you have any mentors while you were growing up through, through Glass as well? There was a guy in this area. His name was Bill Burke, and he did malls. And I was making stuff with my little burns torch, no oxygen. It took three hours to make a piece that big. And it wasn't even fused 
it was just really thoroughly stuck together. My parents still have some of those pieces. Um, and Bill Burke came by and he saw me set up in a mall one day and he was quite shocked that somebody was doing this kind of stuff with just the torch that I had. So he came by and set me up with a national 3A and, and uh, oxygen and propane. And he made a giraffe and he made a deer. And one of the things he did when he made the deer, he heated up the neck and then he twisted the head a little bit. He said, Mylon, don't ever make anything just looking straight forward. That's boring. So really planned the seed of the motion that I put in a lot of my stuff. Yeah. So Bill demonstrating those two pieces and saying that to me really was important to me. And in the early 80s, I was in New York City and I did a lot of work with the ballet and dance community there. And of course, that's all about motion, right? Mm -hmm. So I learned more about motion there. So, you know, there's been a lot of influences without them actually taking me by the hand. There's a woman named Margaret Nair. She's in Ithaca. She does beautiful orchids and flowers and her color work is incredible. And she showed me how to do a tubing encasement, taking a colored rod with dicer on it or something, sleeving it in a piece of heavy wall tubing and then melting it on. She was doing it on a very small level. And of course I made it big, but it's because of Margaret that I learned how to do that. And I'd have to say, there's probably not a student that I spent any time with that I didn't learn something important from. So you know, even the, a beginner, a super beginner will find something to to help you learn to whether grow your skill or teach somebody else how to overcome that challenge. Yeah, you know, and that's what's cool is, you know, you feel like you and I are connected for many years, but this is really the first time we've ever seen each other. Right. So right. that's very cool. That's one of the things I like about books is when you write a book. You've got your voice speaking directly into the other person's mind with no intermediaries to muddle up what you're saying. And you don't have to boot it up. You don't have to turn it on. Um, it's always going to be compatible with your hand as you turn the pages. And, you know, they'll be around for hundreds of years and people can still look at them mm -hmm. and still get value and use out of them. So I've always been very fond of books as a way of communicating with people. Yeah, yeah, that's neat, man. And uh, yeah, you're working on a book right now, right? Yeah, um, it's at the printer, so it should be done in about a week. It's uh, Here's a, a prototype of it. It's called Aesop's Fables Illustrated in Glass. So one of the things I did last year during COVID, we all had some time, and what I did is I made sculptures. And so I found an old copy of the fables and noticed that they're actually collated and translated by a guy named Townsend who I don't think we're related, but maybe we are. Probably <laughs> we are somewhere. So that kind of got my attention and I just started making these sculptures. So I made 50 sculptures in 50 weeks. <laughs> and I learned a lot of really, look at this one. This is the monkey and the dolphin. And look at the wave. That's a very cool wave technique that I stole from the, where there's a lot of people who will take a pile of frit, melt it together and then manipulate it while it's hot. That's what I did. I took a pile of frit, I heated it up to 1700 degrees, took it out and manipulated it and used it to do that with. So one of the nice things about- So wait a minute, from, you're uh, still learning and you're still finding new techniques? Every single freaking day, <laughs> all the time. And you have a question on here about challenging myself, right? Oh my goodness, I'm working on a piece right now which is kicking my butt. I'm on, I'm on my third go round on it. It's a decanter, uh, which is two flamingos with the grasses and cattails and everything's hollow. So the liquid can pour it through everything. And it's a struggle, I think. This one had better work because <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, really hard. I'm doing a series for my friend, Tim. You know, the story of Troy, Homer's Iliad, right? With mm -hmm. Ulysses and Achilles and Hercules and Hector and all those people, right? Killing each other. I'm doing a series of those pieces for my friend, Tim. I just finished Hercules. I'm going to post it tomorrow and Monday on Facebook and Instagram. 
Um, and then part of this project is the horse. So I'm going to do the Trojan horse, <laughs> two or three feet big, um, out of clear glass. I'll have a hinged opening on it so that you can open it up and see all the little people in their, their uh, armor and things inside of it. That's an incredibly difficult project, um, but I'm very excited about it. Um, I've got to do Galadriel pouring into the mirror, the mirror of Galadriel. I'm doing that maybe tomorrow or next day. I'll start on that. You know, uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan fighting with lasers in the Lava River. I got to do that for somebody. I have some very interesting projects in house right now, and all of them are difficult. Do you, so, do you uh, ever get a project that's too difficult, you pass away, or maybe too simple and say, man, that's, that's not going to be challenging enough for me? Quite like that, but it's kind of like that. The second one, there's projects I don't take because I do two kinds of work, basically. One is commission work that's interesting and mm, kind of a high budget. And then the other is production work to sell at my festivals. And I don't know if this is true for everybody. It, it probably is. I make a lot more money on the little boring stuff. I can make $600 an hour making little earrings, right? But to do a decanter that take that I sell for $700, that'll take me mm, six hours. So I'm making, you know, a ton of what I make. I'm making the little things, but of course we'd all go crazy if all we did was make the little stuff. So I haven't yet completely crapped out and, and failed a hundred percent. I've been very close. Um, who is it? Somebody said you haven't failed until you stop attempting, right? Right, right. You, you fail when you stop trying, right? And I don't right. generally stop trying. So I just keep trying again until I can make it work. And the key, I think, for me is to look at specifically what is it that didn't work? Mm -hmm. Why did this crack? Like this flamingo decanter. I keep my kiln at 1125 for my standard working temperature. So I can throw it in stuff in there for five or 10 minutes, take it out and work on it, right? Mm -hmm. But if I leave it in there too long, things wilt a little bit because it's so hot. So what I did is I took it down to 1100. So things don't wilt, but it's not as hot. I don't have as long a window to work on them. And that's one of the reasons that I was struggling with this piece because I was working on it at a lower temperature. And my wife said, what are you doing different? Because I normally don't have that kind of problem. The, the piece on the floor in pieces, pretty rare. So, but it still happens to even, even oh, you. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> I mean, I, I hate to hear that, but at the same time, uh, as a, a lower skilled glass blower, it's comforting that when something breaks, it's not just, ah, it's probably cause you're trying a little bit outside of your skill set, And, uh, if you're not pushing, you're not breaking maybe. Well, uh, Robert Mickelson said to me once, if you're not making mistakes, you're not really trying. Mm -hmm. And I was very comfortable then doing mostly wholesale production work. We do very little wholesale now, almost none. We do two Renaissance festivals where it's a really good business model for us. And we like just being out in the woods and stuff like that. There's a lot about it that we like. Um, so we don't do a lot of wholesale. Um, so... The nice thing about that, of course, is you're selling it for retail dollars. So you get more money for the same work than you used to uh, for wholesale. So I, I take a lot of commissions. Uh, and one of the reasons I like doing that is because it, it'll take me somewhere I wouldn't have gone otherwise. Right. right? And often I can kind of steer them in a direction that I wanted to go anyways. Like I wanted to do, the last time I did a spider web was in 1978. Uh, and I was telling my parents the other day, it's the only piece I ever won a prize for. I won second place and I put it in the car after the show and my assistant put her foot through the middle of it. So, <laughs> but I've wanted to do for a long time, a spider web covered with dew drops. I think that'll be really nice. And I've tried it a couple times over the years. And what happens is if you have a really thin piece of whatever you're using 
for the web and then you put the dewdrops on it, the heat from the dewdrops takes away the yeah. clean line of the web and totally ruins the illusion. Right. So something I tried the other day was I took some of that really dense Chinese white that you can't get anymore and I cased it in quite a bit of clear and I drew it out and I made the spider web line with it and I used a teeny oh. tiny tip. And that worked without distorting the internal line of the white color. So I got some young lady whose dad wants a spider web. So I'm talking to them. I've been talking to them for about a month. We, we communicate once a week or once every two weeks by, I forget, email or something. And at some point, I think we'll do that, but they got to come up with a budget. It won't be a cheap piece, mm -hmm. but it'll be a really awesome piece. But there's another fable I haven't done yet. This book has 50 fables in it, right? And it was great because, you know, I got to do all this different stuff. But there's a, one of the fables is not in this book. I haven't done it yet. There's hundreds. It's called the, the gnat and the lion. All right. A gnat is irritating a lion. The lion's trying to catch the gnat, trying to catch it. He can't do it. And then he goes like this to catch the gnat. And he scratches his own face. The gnats, ha, 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 I'm better than the lion. Flies away, bam, right into a spider web. And the spider says, well, who's the big deal now? So that's a spider web I can do, right? And that's one of the interesting things about the fables is you get to pick which moment illustrates the best. And I just want to make a spider web. So I will make an incredible spider web with a spider on one side and a gnat tangled up in the other side. And I may or may not put the new drops on it. I don't know. Right. So I'm just trying to make it be what I want it to be. So hopefully these other people will be able to come up with a budget so I can do a really awesome spider web for them. But everything comes down to time. budget, right? It comes down Pardon? to a, but uh, everything comes down to budget and people want stuff for free, but if they can't give you the money, it's, it's pointless because like you said, it might take you two or three attempts and, and they're not, they're not paying th for those failed attempts. And, uh, right. Yeah. It's like my friend, Tim, I'm doing the, uh, the Iliad pieces for Hercules and all that jazz. I'm not charging him very much at all. Cause he's like my oldest friend, you know, he built part of my studio. We went to church together when we were like six years old. I know his family, he knows my family, blah, 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 like that. And uh, he commissioned me to do it. This was interesting. Um, toward the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, just when COVID was shutting everything down and we didn't know what would happen. So he wanted to help me out by giving me some work because I didn't have very much work. So I, I'm doing this project for him. But now we've gotten so, last year, was, <laughs> this year was so crazy in terms of how much work we got. It's like, I don't have time to do it all without getting sick. So, uh, but I'm doing this project for Tim. He's my friend. He's paying me enough. And it's an awesome series of pieces that I might not have taken the time to make otherwise. So, right. like I said, I'll post Hercules tomorrow and Monday. So if you want to look at it, it'll be on Instagram and on my Facebook. So it's, it's pretty cool. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, what are your favorite items to blow? Or to produce, because I guess you don't blow a lot of pipes. You're a, an artist. All my decanters are blown. The decanters right? are blown. Right, right. All of them. 100% hollow. Right. I was doing a thing uh, here, the AGI, uh, of the Austin Art Glass Initiative. Micah Evans was there. Me and Micah and Salt. And Micah showed me how to do the J seal. Yeah. And that changed my life. My goodness, that is such a cool move. So some of my pieces have 50 J seals in them to put them all together with all the different connections and everything. I got to do one for somebody next month. It's the DNA molecule. It's about that big and it's got probably 30 or 40 of the guanine, taurine, cytosine and adenine, whatever they are um, in the center of it. Uh, and they all have to have J seals on them. So I've really enjoyed the decanters because I had to learn so much. Right. Um, so I've been doing them about five or six years now, and there are a couple of people starting to knock me off. So that was inevitable. Uh, That's a good thing, right? 
I mean, it's not good, but okay. it, it means that uh, you've knocked it out of the park. So, <laughs> Well, it used to happen long ago, too. They'd even take some of my stuff to China. But my best solution is just keep moving forward and leave them in your dust. You know, mm -hmm. keep making so many cool new things that they can't keep up with you. Right. So the decanters have been great. Um, they've been a lot of fun. It's nice to have a higher price point thing. A lot of the stuff I make at festivals, it's like a hundred to five hundred dollars. The canners start at eight hundred and they go up to five thousand. So that's higher for me. Right. It's not much compared to what some of the pipes go for, but for me, that's pretty good money. I'm I'm fine with that. Right. And it's all clear glass. I don't do any color work at all. Right. Well, the color is the the wine in there and watching it flow and exactly. seeing it happen. So yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And clear is no joke. Like clear shows all the, if you didn't get a beautiful wall thickness or a perfect seal, like clear yes, shows it does. off. <laughs> I just ordered an Aquala from somebody. I don't know I'm what that is. Not quite a lathe hand assistant. It's like half a lathe. Oh yeah, that, that thing that they got. That thing, that's right. I, <laughs> um, I got one coming. No, seriously, I'm very excited about it. Um, and I think it's gonna help me uh, you know, put part of the decanter together, putting the joint on the top so it can rotate the whole thing while I've got two hands to work on putting the part on there and stuff like that. And my wife thinks, and she's probably right, she usually is, that I'll figure out a lot of other things to do with it too. Probably. My friend, my friend Raven makes marbles with his and he goes up to four inches on it. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to get that. That's a major new thing I'm going to learn. And that'll change my work. I don't know quite how yet, but I'm pretty sure that it will. So this is one of the ways that I learn. I'm doing a series of articles in the flow, I think, on creativity. I've been doing okay. it for some years now. And the current little mini series in there is about how tools and equipment can change the way you think. The last one I just did was about using the stump sucker and doing encasements inside borosilicate glass. Okay. Uh, and the next one, I don't know what, I've, I've got a couple of weeks before it has to be done. So uh, I'm sure I'll think of something. Yeah. Man, you just keep moving a hundred miles an hour. That's awesome. Um, so do you get to collaborate often with a lot of other artists then? I know uh... not a lot, not a lot. I, we did something with uh, Lucan and Robert Mickelson at the AAGI a year or two ago. Uh, there's a guy named Raven Copeland who does marbles. He's fairly well known for his marbles. And he and I have done about 15 or 20 pieces. And we just did a couple of really cool pieces. Um, I used the stump sucker to make a little scuba diver encased in clear glass. He put it deep into a vortex marble. And one of them, that was it. But the other one, I have a client who wants that piece with embellishment. So over the top of it, it's going to have all the shallow coral reef and fishes. And underneath it, it's going to have the deeper ocean fishes. So there's that. And when we posted that uh, a couple of months ago, we got a tremendous response to people saying, do that with a spaceman and blah, blah, blah. So Raven and I do things on a pretty regular basis. And my friend, Bob Stefan, uh, you may have heard of his glassworks. That's where you get grinding and polishing and cold working. Equipment. Oh, right, right. Um, Bob Stefan is the guy that that's his company. And we've known each other for 30 years. And he makes these incredible uh, little spheres laminated together with dichro and they're just magical so just yesterday and today we've been talking about how he can make them for me he's just going to send me some base uh, plain ones that i can put in a dragon's claw or something like that but i want him to drill holes in the sides so that i can put steel rods in it and make a dragon with a concave space in his chest so that I can mount this thing and it'll spin in the dragon's chest. So that'll be cool. Yeah, no doubt. It I looks got, like it, looked, it's, it sounds like you're just having still too much fun, man. And I can't I say too much, but no, no, I still like what I do, which is good because I do it all the 
all the time. <laughs> so do you, do you find uh, you have more passion uh, now than when you first started? Uh, that's a hard one. Um, it's how I make my living. So where's the passion in pumping out enough calla lily earrings to pay the bills this month? Is that passion? Not so much. Um, but I try very hard to make each one well and excellently with clean lines and make them really nice. Uh, so that's not about passion. That's about making a living. The passion comes, especially with the commission pieces or something I just got, like the spider web, right? I'm very excited about the spider yeah. web, the deep drops. I got to do that. And one way or another, I'll do it for a book. I'll do it for those people, or I'll just make it myself. I don't care because I want to. And you know, my wife is uh, very business oriented. She's from Japan. She's very uh, focused. And there's this balance between making things because you're excited about it, but what if nobody ever buys them and you spent three days working on that and blah, 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 which is a valid question. Mm -hmm. um, but something really interesting happened this year. I don't know, probably all of us, we can produce more than we can sell. Yes. Usually, right? Mm -hmm. If you worked all day long, every day, you'd have so much stuff and you wouldn't have sold it all by the end of the year. This year, we sold everything I made and stuff we had from before. And now we're out of everything. So we That's did great. extremely well this year. And now I've got work until next July. I, I can't take any more orders until then, which is wonderful. But it's also bad because there's people I've been doing work for for 10 years. And I have to tell them, I'm sorry, I can't do that for you right now. Right. What are you going to do? Because my wife has this stupid idea that we should make the pieces in the order that we took the orders crazy right <laughs> in some worlds it works good but in a creative <laughs> world it can't happen no she's right you know mm -hmm. i've got people i mean the flamingos guy ordered that in april and you're just getting to it now third attempt even though He's going to get value. I mean, it's a wonderful piece. And I talk to the person, we figure out how much they can afford, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And he like his budget was less than $3,000. So we both know that it's going to make it $2,950 or whatever like that, right? It'll be less than $3,000. It'll be worth four or five. It'll be right. a wonderful, amazing piece. Right. I don't care. I got the opportunity to make an amazing thing. I got paid for it. He gets a good value. It's not, I'm not trying to get every nickel and dime I can from everybody. I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to do the work that I still do like doing. So, yeah. you know. And potentially get paid because, because like you were talking about, you could make a piece and maybe nobody will buy it. So with the commissions, it allows you to expand and, and still be like, I did it and, and, and be able to get that food. Right. And they gave me a deposit and they'll pay the balance before you get the piece. So that's very nice. It's yeah. pre-sold work that you haven't made yet. That's, that's cool, but it's pressure. We used to, well, this thing happened. I don't know if you saw the jellyfish video. Did you see that? The jellyfish decanter? Uh, no, I don't think I did see that. Okay. Look it up on Instagram sometime, yeah. whatever. We sold the jellyfish decanter to somebody who gave it to her dad. And he, they made a very cute video of him filling it up and then pouring it out into a glass. Really cute. And I stitched the videos together. I put some music on it. I posted it. It's close to a million views now at, in different places. And as a result of that, we sold lots of decanters. <laughs> a lot of them were jellyfish, but we sold other ones also. So right. I'm just trying to catch up with that one right now. So, yep. That's just neat how the environment, you made something and somebody did something special in their environment, you noticed it and it just, and then all yeah. of a sudden it blew up. Yeah. Years ago, my first decanter ever, maybe my second, it was this big octopus. And I posted that and it got 3 million views, but this is five years ago, six years ago. I didn't even know how much I was going to sell it for. 
I had out of 3 million views, you know, we got 10,000 inquiries, right? Wow. Wow. I didn't even know what to tell them. It was horrible. <laughs> Did you just keep raising the price till it went to one person left? No, <laughs> no, no. I, I made a price. Uh, we sold it to that guy. He still has it. We're good friends. We see him in Maryland every year. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I have the ability to be satisfied. There right. is such a thing as enough. I don't need, if I, if I have enough, I can pay. We don't have a mortgage anymore. I'm happy to say, so I'm not paying the mortgage, but if I have enough money to pay the bills and take care of the car and have real heavy cream in my coffee and get 18 year old scotch instead of 10 year old scotch, I'm a simple man. Right. Life's good. Right. Right. That's cool, man. Um, I guess. Have you ever competed in any events or? Yeah, once. Well, a couple of times, actually. That was the um, spider web tree you had, and that was your. Well, that was just a show. I wasn't competing. There was a thing at Albuquerque in about 15 years ago. I don't remember exactly. It was a flame off. Lewis Wilson was running it. Um, I made what I thought was a really cool piece in Marcel beat me. He made a big octopus. So, uh, and then there was a thing about seven years ago in Las Vegas, a big flame off with teams of people from all over the, the country and the world actually. Yeah. And my, my thing was so bad that I'm grateful that, Will Menzies, mm -hmm. uh, Flo, he was running in that competition. And then the, the weird thing was the competition was Saturday, Sunday, and then the judging was Monday morning. But I had a thing to go to in New York City where I had like nine pieces in an exhibition there. So I had to leave before the judging. And Will was such a wise man. My thing was so bad that and it was we had a team that he pulled it and didn't even show it because he said it would have been so bad for my reputation mm. so imagine how hard that must have been for him but he so made the right call it, i'm really grateful to him so my point being i've gone down multiple times sometimes in public it totally happens i'm still working Right. I've, I've done some good work since then. Right. I've done some incredible work since then. So I drop things on the floor. I mean, I don't drop it, but it might crack and fall off the punty. That can happen. Um, I don't stop. I don't, I, I yell. I don't use bad words, but I do some pretty loud primal screaming. Um, you got to get that and, out. It's a shock. Like, oh, I do. I do. It's like, I'm not going to do it now because it, it makes my after I've done it. Right. I mean, it's really serious. Uh, so, no, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to keep doing this. And even though I've had some serious failures and even still do today, I'm going to keep working on it. And the, the flamingo, as I'm doing it more carefully this time, here's th something interesting. Um, I was looking at the video demo for the Nikwala, that not quite a lathe hand assistant, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and was Scott Deppy doing some work with it? You know, Scott? Yep, yep. yep. And uh, Mike, who made the machine, was describing Scott as being very meticulous and very careful and doing a lot of prep work before he put hot. I tend to be a little sloppy. I just whack it together hot and I do it. I'm very fast, but I'm not as meticulous as some people. And I was looking at Scott work. I thought, wow, that's pretty impressive the way he's focused on the detail like that. And so working on the flamingos this time, I'm kind of thinking about the way Scott was working in the prep work he did before he put the components together. So I learned that he doesn't have any idea. I watched him. Maybe he'll see right. this. That would be cool. Right. We, 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 we've met each other, but we never talked very much. But I learned something really important from him just by watching that video because I'm getting this machine. 
So hopefully it'll be successful. Man. And I back that, up to 1125 so that it won't crack. Right. And man, that's so neat. You point that out. It's just constantly always going out in your environment, seeing stuff that, that is going to help you out. And, and I guess having the skill set and stuff to see what somebody else is doing to, to bring it into your world and help you out. And, yeah, and sometimes it's not even a specific technique. It's just a way of thinking that they're doing. So, yeah, I was very impressed by uh, what he was doing. And I thought, maybe I should try to think like that a little bit because it might make the work better. So, I'm Scott, I'm trying to do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, what, what can we look forward to in the future from you? I know we got the book coming out. You have a Kickstarter, too, that we can uh, go check out and help with, right? Please. Absolutely. Um, it's Aesop's Fables Illustrated in Glass. You'd find it on Kickstarter under that. We're fully funded for the first level, which is really cool. And we've still got almost two weeks left. But what we're trying to do is get to the stretch goal so we can do an ebook and an audiobook. I, I'll get to read the fables out loud myself. So... <laughs> I really want to do that. So if anybody checks it out, please don't not do something because it looks like it's fully funded. And I don't know if you know how Kickstarter works. It's an all or nothing model. Mm -hmm. So if you don't make your goal, nobody gets anything. You don't get the money. They don't get the stuff. Nothing happens. So it's actually important to set the goal a little low to make sure that you do make it. And the fully funded isn't really as much as it costs to print the book, but it's a big help. Right. It's, it's been wonderful, actually. It's been really wonderful. Uh, a number of people have been very generous. I'm not asking anybody to do this. Don't misunderstand me. But a number of people have just put down some pretty serious amounts of money and they don't even want anything for it. They're just supporting me because we're friends or they're generous people. Um, although we do have, they get a sculpture or the books or print or something like that. We have some pretty nice rewards they can pick. But it's been a very... Uh, kind of an uplifting experience to have so many people chip in and help me out. It's I've never done it before, and I was pretty uh, nervous about it before we started, but it's it turned out pretty well, and I'm very grateful for it. it costs this, a lot to make a book. And this was all pretty much kind of a, it sounds like a thing from COVID, where it kind of threw some stuff in there. You said, hey, man, I'm going to go with this idea. And, yep. and that's what I just love is, you know, like life, it just throws lemons out there all day at you. And you can either just suck on them and say it sucks or just go find that sugar, baby, and, and do what Margarita. you need. Yeah. 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 I love yeah, it. Yeah, no, I was, I was very grateful for the time. Um, it was really great to be able to just do whatever. And, of course, we had time. We have a very well-established <laughs> bird population in our yard, so we could see the birds and observe their behavior. Uh, we had some very nice bottles of wine sitting outside looking at the birds. Like I said before, we actually, for the first time in, since I was a teenager, really, I slowed down and just chilled out a little bit. We don't do that very much. Right. So, yeah, I might take a couple of days off this weekend. So I'm hoping, hoping to do that. We'll see if that happens or not. That's our current plan. You should do it. Where, where are you located? We're in uh, Colorado Springs. Oh, nice. Yeah, not bad. So, yeah. Yep, you, you have winter there sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's it, we're in the spring, so it seems like it's, uh, it, you know, Colorado Rockies, but we don't get shit here. We get two or three snows a year. We're just praying for snow. We're so dry. We're basically right. a desert here. Uh, uh -huh. People think of the mountains, but mostly Colorado is just this dry desert, so... But yeah, if you ever come out to Colorado Springs, man, I got a I got a fifth wheel. You can stay out here. So please do. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, y'all. That was freaking cool. Uh, you know, just really neat sitting down there. I was really nervous sitting down uh, getting before doing this, sitting down with them. Uh, but it was it was like hanging out with an old buddy. These are, are so cool. Uh, this is definitely one uh, put my uh, hat feathers as a super big win for such a, uh, a giant inspiration in the community. Uh, thanks again, Mylon, for joining us. And make sure you go check out his Kickstarter and get this new book. It's a really cool thing. Uh, I know I'm going to get in line for it. 
Uh, also, uh, I want to put out there really quickly, we have a really cool thing you can do and uh, you can join Elevate Veterans. We have all kinds of packages uh, you can purchase with which get you a product as well as help get uh, veterans some cash to help uh, get veterans some new programs or a surfer or something like that. Uh, you can also just donate money by going to elevateveterans.com. Also, uh, you can check out elevateambassador.com. We need your help there. Uh, get the word out and uh, you can become an Elevate doll or an Elevate gent and earn credits, earn some dollars. Uh, more importantly, you get to help me out. You get to help out our whole team here and help all, all these people that are building this Elevate thing. And you get to be a part of this really cool thing called Elevate. It's, a, it's an awesome part of this dream that we got going on. So anyways, uh, thanks a lot. If you like what we're doing, subscribe, tell your friends, and uh, go check it all out at elevateglassgallery.com. Peace out, y'all.